presentation of To the Best of My Knowledge on WPSU is made possible in part by support from the Penn State Alumni Association, informing, involving, and inspiring Penn State alumni and students through its publications, programs, and events. On the web at alumni.psu.edu. And from the members of WPSU. From the studios of Penn State Public Broadcasting, this is a special edition of To the Best of My Knowledge. Good evening, I'm Graham Spanier. Tonight we'll be talking about sports journalism and the role of sports in society. More than ever, sports is big business with major implications for society. As the power and influence of sports have grown, so has the importance of sports journalism. In this age of 24-7 news cycles, sports writers are expected to provide more than just game coverage, personality profiles, and statistics. In the next hour, we'll talk with some of the industry's best writers about the state of their industry and about providing guidance for future sports journalists. We'll also take questions from our studio audience. Now let's meet our guests. Malcolm Moran is director of the John Curley Center for Sports Journalism at Penn State and the inaugural Knight Chair in Sports Journalism and Society. His distinguished 30-year career as a sports journalist has been impressive. He's worked for USA Today, The New York Times, Newsday, and the Chicago Tribune and has covered 26 bowl games, 26 men's basketball Final Fours, 16 World Series, 11 Super Bowls, several NCAA conventions, and two Olympic Games. Tom O'Toole is the college sports editor for USA Today. In addition to covering college athletics, he has covered eight Olympics, 12 Final Fours, six Wimbledons, seven Masters, and a few Super Bowls and World Series. Also with us is Jim Welch, Deputy Managing Editor for Sports at USA Today, where he was one of the newspaper's founding editors in 1982. He coordinates the Daily Sports Report and oversees the USA Today Top 25 Coaches Football Poll. He also served three years as a weekly college football analyst on CNN. Thank you all for being on our program tonight. You know, a lot of people think that uh, being in the roles that you folks have been in is the dream job. Uh, maybe it is some of the time and maybe not uh, all the time. Maybe you could begin by giving us a little idea about what, what life is like and uh, what uh, careers are like for people in your business. Well, first of all, my wife thinks I have a hobby, not a job. And, uh, she reminds me of that all the time. <clears throat> I have a lot of friends who just are very envious about the places we get to go, the things we get to see, the seats we get to have. But I can tell you this, it is a tremendous amount of work and, and any young journalist has to know that it's a commitment 14 hour, 15 hour days during the recent March Madness. Mm -hmm. uh, tremendous amount of effort it takes, but we work with a lot of good people and I have to say all in all, it's a lot of fun. And how do you characterize uh, your role these days? Uh, I would have to agree with Tom. The, uh, there's a lot of excitement. We've, we've both been to eight Olympics. Um, to be able to go to places like that and be you know, kind of the first witness to history up close and be able to write about it, um, sometimes you, you kind of kick yourself and you say, I can't believe I'm getting paid for doing this. But as Tom said, it's, it is a whole lot of work, and, and, we're, and we're in a very challenging feel these days because there's so much going on in, in, uh, in other media, including our own, uh, our own website and things like that. And it's really important for us to stay up on those kind of developments. Tom and I were once on a panel and uh, a student asked us, uh, you know, how do we prefer news to sports? Because each of us has covered news as well as sports. I had covered conflicts in Central America and that sort of thing. And Tom, Tom's answer that day, which I thought was rather telling, and I have to admit to have used it a few times, is, you know, I, uh, you know a, a bad basketball game is better than a good city council meeting or something like that. So <laughs> I let that speak for me. Malcolm, you've made the transition from doing sports journalism and being a great sports journalist 
to uh, producing the next generation of sports well, journalists. Oh, and it's a work in progress, because I mean, I'll admit March was rough because the, the last NCAA tournament I didn't cover was in 1978. So, you know, every once in a while, it's like, you know, the horse starts twitching and you want to get going. But when, when you see people responding to your ideas and catching on to how it works, I mean, that's a very rewarding thing. And tell us a little about the Center for Sports Journalism at Penn State. Well, it was created long before I came on board. I mean, it was the brainchild of John Curley, whose name now is linked to it. And it was created in... 2003, and it was my understanding that that existence of a center was an important part of why the Knight Foundation chose Penn State, because the proposal did not talk about something that may exist someday. It talked about something that had been in place for several years. A lot of people think that your lives are about rubbing elbows with celebrities, in your case, sports celebrities. How much uh, elbow rubbing goes on, and uh, what kind of distance is there between the journalists and the uh, people who are making the news? There's a lot more distance now, some of it good and some of it bad. I mean, there's, there's no more going out drinking bourbon with the coach after practice as the, the legends had it in the old days. Um, there, there is a, you, you get the, all the coverings like you know, peeled away from these athletes, you get to see them, and they're, they're, not as, they're not the heroes that they're made out to be. But in terms of separation, the greatest thing growing is access. That, that is the biggest problem we have right now. We don't even get the rub elbows to ask questions a lot of places. You've got an evolution of athletes with their own websites that they release their own news and do their own interviews on their own websites. Mm -hmm. So that the, the biggest challenge we've had, particularly in colleges, is, is access with closed practices, very limited uh, interview time, and it's, it gets very frustrating. How about with uh, coaches? Are coaches getting uh, crankier and more difficult to, uh, to get access to, or is a part of their job spending even more time with the media and making themselves available? I think they're, they are probably a little crankier, and in many cases with good reason. One thing uh, we saw recently was a major program, I believe it was Purdue, um, a rival institution, that uh, has decided to close its practices partially because of the blogs. You know, people would come to the practices and before you know it, someone's type, typing away about injuries or who looked good, who didn't look too well, um, trick plays, whatever it is. And obviously, you know, smart coaches in this day and age don't do a lot of those in practice out in the open. But uh, I think they have reason to be crankier and, and for that, that reason they're more arm's length than ever mm -hmm. before. Yeah, I'm so glad that I was not a beat reporter in the era of, you know, blogs, radio talk show because the, the, the things that get thrown out there, the, I don't want to say lies, but the misconceptions or the, the misleading things that get thrown up on the internet, a lot of them are true. Ask Larry Eustachy. I mean, you have to check all these things out. That's another thing. When you, if you, you, in this day of the blogs, you have to check out almost everything in a chat room because it could be true, yeah. because we've seen enough evidence that they have been true. Malcolm, I was talking today with uh, our Vice President for University Relations just about the phenomenon of blogs generally. Uh, it seems to me that just going back maybe even two or three years, a lot of sports reporters and coaches developed relationships and a certain understanding about what they could talk about, what lines would and wouldn't be crossed. And that facilitated good coverage and a, a good reporter knew when he had information that uh, might allow him or her to make a story better without crossing a line that got a coach in trouble or gave away a trade secret uh, about a team. And now with the blogs, uh, as, as our folks are saying, the whole playing field is, is different and there isn't that kind of respect and it might be making it difficult for the people who make their living as sports journalists. Uh, it, how, do, how do you see it? It's far more difficult because you used to have access to context. Uh, for example, when Bill Parcells coached the Giants, I mean, here's somebody who has a reputation as being pretty tough on us. But on Saturdays, when very few people would come around, the day before a home game, for instance, and basically the reporters would just show up to make sure nobody tripped over the 50-yard line during the walkthrough, he would reward you for coming out 
by saying off the record what his thoughts were about tomorrow. So then when you go into that game on Sunday, even if you haven't written very much for the Sunday paper about his private thoughts, you would have a sense of context. You would be better informed to ask your questions after the game. Now, in the age of the chat room site, the camera phone, the blog, coaches understandably are putting the walls up. And, and from, from the perspective of somebody just trying to understand what's happening, it's infinitely more difficult to gain that context. Nick Saban learned a uh, lesson in his first week on the job or his first month on the job at Alabama in a supposedly off-the-record conversation. He had a, a, a slur against Cajuns that I don't think was reported in the papers. I think one of the writers put it on his blog, and then that picked up steam and uh, got him in quite a bit of deserved trouble. Mm -hmm. Now, in USA Today, your main product, people might, might uh, conclude, is getting a newspaper ready for the following morning. But uh, you have websites, and a lot of other people have websites, and even the sports reporters covering a story will get it up on the web on a, on a digital version of their paper moments after they write it before it's even in print. How has that changed the course of how you do your reporting and the system of checks and balances because you've only got maybe minutes to review right. a story rather than thinking about it for a few hours yeah, before it, it gets set in type, so to speak. There's been times you want to reach out and, and pull it back, and, and once it's on the web, it, the Washington Post learned a lesson just recently. Something was on the web for, I think, 59 seconds, yeah. and it was picked up by, by some bloggers, and uh, it caused a little bit of a stir. But it, it, one thing has been the demand on reporters, the time demands to write. I mean, we don't publish on Saturday and Sunday, but our writers write on the weekends mm -hmm. from the Final Fours or from the Super Bowl or wherever they are on the weekends. Another thing that's a big change has been at night, after you write for our deadline, like our, our uh, Marilyn Garcia, who covers college basketball for us, one of the Thursday nights during the NCAA tournament, after she was done writing on a really tight deadline, she caught her breath and then she wrote a longer story for the web that night, which made her feel a little better about what she wrote, but it's, she's up till three, four in the morning doing that. You know, it's an interesting thing, uh, the journey we've taken with this when, when we first launched our website about 10 years ago. Um, it was almost as if we were in competition with each other. It was, hey, we've got this story, uh, they can put it up on the web tomorrow after the paper comes out. But now we've, we've, we've evolved into a, a situation where we're, uh, you know, writing for the web and updating for the newspaper. And uh, Tom's, all his reporters during the NCAA basketball tournament were filing right away to the website and would come back and write a more contextual piece, you know, mm -hmm. perhaps uh, for the next day. But uh, it's a real transformation and we have to, we have to really embrace it. And because um, that's where a lot of people, especially young people like many in our audience here, get their news that way. And uh, if they get their news that way, that's where the advertisers are going to go and that's where the revenue streams are going to come from. Speaking of young people in the audience, uh, we have several here, uh, really across the entire age range, but we've got this brilliant, enthusiastic audience and uh, throughout our program we're going to be taking some questions and we're going to turn to you, Melanie, for the first one. So if you'd stand and uh, uh, let's hear what, uh, what you're going to ask about. Okay, um, on the topic of sort of multi-platform reporting, you say it's how most of us get our news through the internet now. How do you think the duties of an aspiring journalist have to kind of change in this day and age when looking for a job? I would say um, one of the things is you got to stay up with the technology. You need to try and be able to look around corners at, to, at what's coming next. Um, our company now is equipping reporters with video cameras and all kinds of other devices. It's kind of called backpack journalism. And uh, the idea is you go out and, and cover it every which way you can. So I think the more you can learn about those things, the better. But also, a lot of it comes back to basics. One, one of the things we try to sell is the notion that our <coughs> newspaper, our website, provides information, news, that you can trust, that, that has been checked out, that's been fully vetted, um, that's going to be interesting and fun to read as well, but also accuracy and things like that, fairness, balance, all those things come into play. So you don't want to overlook those, those sort of tried and true uh, traditions of the business as well. One thing that's happening too with the people that are in the business now, 
is they are trying to catch up to the technology that you all take for granted, all the things you can do. I have a guy on my staff who's in his 50s, and until I showed him last week, he could not do, create a word, attach, I mean, a word document and attach it to an email. He had no idea, and this is something I think my 14-year-old daughter probably does routinely. That wasn't me, by the way. I just <laughs> want that. <laughs> you know, the, there's a part of your business that's always driven me a little crazy. Um, as you know, I started out as a sports reporter and did it for a, a number of years in my youth, and I was just pretty much doing straightforward reporting. But uh, over the years, it seems there's been uh, an explosion of sports columnists. Now, some of the sports reporters for certain publications occasionally then do a column, which is more loose and opinion-based. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you wonder about what lines they might be drawing. But there's some people who only do columns. And uh, a lot of times, the columns we read, uh, that I read, about Penn State athletics, for example, are just wrong. There are, they're supposedly based on some element of fact that it, it's just plain wrong. And there doesn't seem to be the same level of checking or their editors don't seem to hold them to the same standards that they would hold the reporter to, saying, show me the facts, or if this is what you're going with, do you have a second source to confirm that? Uh, they're in the zone of wild speculation to saying something is a fact that isn't. Now, is there something about the standards for columns that are different, or are we just looking at bad columnists when we have observations like the one I, I, I've just made? I think a lot of it, and, and this is a serious problem, is the agenda. The agenda is driving the column, more than checking things out, more than solid reporting. I mean, it used to be that a columnist in a given town was the agenda setter. I mean, whatever the columnist wrote would be what people are talking about at the water cooler. Now the water cooler discussion is being driven by talk radio. And columnists don't want to hear that. So their response is to be more shrill than what you're hearing on talk radio. Mm -hmm. And it's like everybody is trying to outscream each other rather than, I mean, can you imagine Jim Murray and Red Smith screaming at each other on ESPN for a half an hour? <laughs> And, and, and the one with the most points wins. I mean, these yeah. were craftsmen. I mean, you, you can read, you know, and, and people in my class have read, you know, what Red Smith wrote when the, night, the day that Bobby Thompson hit the home run. I mean, it's literature. Mm -hmm. I mean, now it's just screaming, and, and that's what really bugs me. Yeah, the explosion, I think, has been on columnists on TV and these round tables where they sit, and like Malcolm says, and they yell and they scream, and they, they try to one-up each other and, and, and get attention. I think what you'll find is the best columnists are the best reporters, too. They really get, they, these are the ones who come out to Penn State, they go to practice, they talk to people. They don't sit in Harrisburg or Philly or wherever and, and, and just pontificate. If they get out and do their work, their columns are going to be accurate. You might not like them still, mm -hmm. but at least they'll be fair and accurate. Yeah. Now, we're going to open it up to uh, other members of the audience in, in a little bit, but uh, Malcolm, you're helping to train the next generation of sports journalists, and uh, we had a chance to talk to some of our students who are preparing for that, some of whom are associated with our academic programs here. So we have a, a little video we're going to run for all of us here and folks uh, watching on, in our television audience, and then we're going to come back and open it up for all of your questions. So let's roll that video right now. With her back to the basket, quality shot. The diving grab. Quick centering pass and a shot taken by Malkin. I think it started the way a lot of sports journalists tend to start, at least a lot I've come in contact with. It's first uh, a love of sports, whether that be an involvement or as a fan, and then it's some way to sort of stay connected to sports. I came to Penn State uh, not knowing what I wanted to pursue. Um, you know, I've always had um, appreciation for writing, always like words, and, you know, as, as, a, as a young boy, as a young man growing up, you know, there was an attraction to sports. My parents would probably rather I'd be a doctor or, or something along those lines, but, uh, and the money would be nice, but, I mean, this is what I love to do, and I, I wouldn't trade it for anything. That was uh, quite a shock and a pleasant one to have it named after me, and uh, we had set it up a few years ago, 2003, with the idea that 
Penn State really should have a sports journalism program. It has a great sports program, it's got great integrity, and people coming out of here should at least get more experience or have the opportunity to get more experience. So we set it up with the idea in mind that we te teach some courses, bring in speakers, uh, encourage internships, and get them out of here in a more well-rounded fashion than p people from other schools. It's just great to learn from a guy who used to be an editor at USA Today and another that wrote for the New York Times. I mean, I mean, you really can't ask for much more than that. Being able to walk into a guy like uh, Malcolm Moran, who's, you know, night chair for the John Curley Center for Sports Journalism, and just, you know, pick a guy's brain like that. Um, you know, I'm not sure how to talk to Joe Paterno or how to approach him after a press conference. I mean, these guys have been there, they've done it, and, I mean, listening to them and how they approach things and, and what we can take from that, I mean, uh, th that's why I love taking John Curley's classes so much. One thing that is, is really great about Penn State is the speakers that come in and the faculty like Malcolm Moran, who have such a, obviously, a, a history uh, in the business, an awareness of the business, a sense of how things go, asking advice when speakers come in to visit. Those are some of the greatest gems you get right there, how to deal with sources, how to go about writing the tough story. You know, I got an opportunity to talk with Mike Wilbon uh, last summer, and uh, very briefly, very uh, informal, but, you know, just being able to spend a couple moments uh, with a person who you've watched, who you've read, uh, you know, <laughs> religiously, just being able to get encouragement, I think that, that meant a lot to me. I worked at my uh, hometown paper in high school for four years, and, uh, of course, being on the Collegian, I think the Collegian's probably the best thing that's happened to me so far. Being able to go to class and then go to a place like the Collegian where you can apply, um, you know, what it is that you're studying in a classroom, I think it prepares you, you know, to get out there and, and you know, do it full time. The Collegian flew me out to Indianapolis to cover the Big Ten Women's Basketball Tournament earlier this year. I was there with people from newspapers all across the country, Indianapolis Star, Cincinnati Inquirer, Columbus Dispatch, some of the, the biggest newspapers in the country and the best newspapers in the country, and I was sitting at the press table right next to them. So that's the kind of opportunity you get when you get to cover sports of that size at uh, an institution of this caliber. There's always a story to tell, whether that's in a, a Little League baseball game, in an auto race, wh whatever it may be, there's always a story to tell. For football, we have articles on Monday, the game happened Saturday. Everybody knows who won and who lost. 100,000 people witnessed exactly what you witnessed, so it's not exactly news at that point. We'll tell you, you know, why this happened, or what the coach's thinking was, or when Anthony Morelli's having trouble was going through his head. Is he battling something off the field? Is he going through something? Did he have to shut out something to win? You have to frame your story in a way that's going to be interesting and readable, and I think that's a challenge to journalists, especially sports journalists nowadays, with the saturation of news, 24-hour news cycle, everything's already out there. You're a camera, basically. You're a camera for your audience. And you never know what's going to happen, which is one thing I love about sports, too, because I've seen some pretty unpredictable finishes in the couple years I've been doing this, and, and that's, what, that's what keeps you coming back as well. It's not a better feeling than, you know, waking up in the morning and seeing a story that you wrote and knowing that it's right and knowing that you, you know, told somebody something they didn't know before. I did a, a Tony Hunt feature. That was the first article where I feel I, I really sort of, you know, was able to tell people who Tony Hunt really was. And I don't know, that, that meant a lot to me. I'm kind of coming up in the age of the new media, but even still, it, it is a little bit scary because a lot of people can call themselves journalists nowadays. You're talking about the evolution of blogging. You're talking about anybody can make his or her own, you know, website. I think you have to be careful. I think you have to search for credibility. Um, just because it's on a website doesn't necessarily mean that it's fact or that it's accurate. And that's the one thing that credible news sources have, that newspapers have, magazines have. There's an editorial process that goes through. There's fact checking. There's legitimate reporting. Bloggers, people on forums, message boards don't necessarily have that. And that's why it's scary. There are a lot of good writers now. And a lot of those writers, uh, frankly, uh, can tell stories a lot better than people could 40 years ago. Examples include Tom Berducci, a Penn State graduate, Sports Illustrated, John Saraceno, Penn State graduate, is a columnist for uh, 
USA Today, and I happen to have his son in one of my writing classes, and he's good too. And then we have on the television side, Kimberly Jones, who started as a reporter, a uh, sports reporter for the Center of the LA Times, went to the Star Ledger in Newark, covered the Giants, and now is with the Yes Network in uh, New York. If you have talent and, and you're willing to work and you have the personality to sell yourself, you're gonna do all right. You have to treat it seriously. You can't treat it like a hobby or you get hobby results. If you're not a writer, almost first and foremost, then you really don't have a direction to go. You can't have just one specialty. I'm a reporter, I'm a writer, I'm an editor, I'm a mentor. You, you know, you're, you're all those things. You know, I see myself writing. Wherever that is, you know, I hope it's at a, you know, I, you know if it's a website, if it's a magazine, if we're still holding a newspaper, if it's still a newspaper on our doorstep, you know, 10 years from now, we're picking it up. Who knows, but as long as, you know, I'm writing, I think I'm fine with that. We're uh, talking with Tom O'Toole and Jim Welch from USA Today and Malcolm Moran, formerly with USA Today and now here at Penn State in our Center for Sports Journalism. And we have our studio audience here with us and we're gonna open it up for uh, questions and comments from our audience. Hi, I'm, uh, I'm Ryan Smith. I'm a sports journalism uh, major here. And uh, I was wondering, with the, uh, the changes in how um, sports is combined with so many other aspects of news these days, whether it be law or social values. Um, and, you know, if athletes are, you know, being, have legal troubles or uh, the business side of sports being involved with our government, how do you think that has affected the, uh, the role of a sports journalist and how they have to cover sports mixed with news now? Should I show them that list? Tom? Um, yeah, it's funny you should say that because I was <laughs> looking at our, our website uh, recently, and the top four stories, if you open our sports, this is the sports website. One was the uh, Kings allowing Ron Artest to return to the team following his domestic uh, violence arrest. The other was Chris Simon having a disciplinary hearing after he hit the guy in the throat with a stick. The other was O.J. Mayo cited on a marijuana charge. And another one was a, an assistant for the Arizona Cardinals booked uh, for soliciting prostitution. So that's the sports side of USA Today were the, four, the top four How stories. did they do in the game the other night? <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> I, I have told students, and, not, and only half jokingly, it, if you want to go into journalism, it would not hurt to have a finance degree. It would not hurt to have some background in criminal justice. It would not hurt to anything to give you a, a, a nice, diverse resume beyond just, you know, just journalism. And if not a degree, then certainly an emphasis, because you are required to write about things that I don't think we ever envisioned writing about you know, 20, 30 years ago when we started. Do you yeah, see as much of that kind of issue in college sports as you do in pro sports? You know, unfortunately you do. Um, we had a time, I think it was two years ago, in, in a matter of 10 days, there were four or five coaches who were really caught up in, in kind of uh, unfortunate circumstances. Tom earlier mentioned uh, a coach at Iowa State who was photographed um, having entirely too much fun at a sorority party at Missouri, which the team that had just beaten them that night. We had a basketball coach at Georgia, one of the schools that Tom used to cover closely, whose son was, the, um, was an instructor and had all the basketball team and principles of basketball. And the final exam included questions like, how many quarters in a high school game? How many halves in a college game? How many points for a three-point shot? It was incredible. And these guys all, got their passing grades from it and eventually the court the coach had to resign but this all happened actually within one week or ten days or so so there's a lot of it in the college area but it's it's not all about jurisprudence and mayhem mm -hmm. um, contracts you mentioned uh, mm -hmm. knowing about finance uh, health and safety issues orthopedics you don't need to be an expert at those things but it's it's helpful to be conversant and also to know how to get the information obviously it's it's much easier today with the internet but also knowing who the experts are in some of those things, because it's far more than just covering the games these days. But Malcolm Moran, what do you say to students about the zone that they should be in where they're creating a story by digging in somewhere and, and revealing something that might not normally be on the sports pages versus going out and reporting it because it's really out there and needs to be covered? Uh, the role of a reporter as a newsmaker versus a news reporter? Well, the, the key words are out there 
and, and that has become an issue too because things have been reported and regurgitated under the justification that, well, it's out there. Well, that doesn't justify it either if it's not true, if it hasn't been substantiated, or if, if it doesn't relate to what you're trying to cover. I mean, what I would suggest is to keep an end game in mind and just think of relevance. Is this story about player X or coach X who's been through some kind of difficult situation? Is it relevant? Does it affect the credibility of the enterprise, whether it's the NFL, and we've seen a lot of that. We've seen a new commissioner trying to establish uh, grounds for player behavior and possible penalties. I mean, clearly, it affects the enterprise. Obviously, on the college level, it affects it more deeply because you're talking about the credibility of an institution if you have athletes that are getting in trouble. So yeah. I would just say, what's the purpose of what you're doing? Is it just for the sake of it? or is it because there's something more substantial to it? We, we are so super sensitive on a college campus, university presidents, athletic directors, student affairs vice presidents, of trying to treat a student athlete no differently than another student, whether they're in trouble or, or uh, something pops up. Yet the media scrutiny, if you're a student athlete, for the same offense as any other student is in a totally different zone. Um, what, it, what's your advice to us? It, it really is, is to, it's to be aggressive but tread lightly, if that, if that makes any sense, because it's a tough call for us. You know, we're dealing with 18-year-old kids, 19-year-old kids, and I have a 19-year-old kid myself, and a lot of times they're idiots. I know, I know that. <laughs> and uh, it, 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 we, we, we kind of justify the aggressive coverage on what they do wrong with the well, they are the ones that get the glory, and they're the ones that are on the front page when they do well. But I think the, the, the bottom line is if you treat them fair and factually, that's the best you can do. Mm -hmm. Let's take another question from our audience. Yes, sir. Um, my name is Lefty McIntyre, a retired professor, and I would like to ask anyone in the panel a question. With sport having such a big impact on our society, I think most people would agree that it is a, a social institution. It has an impact on socialization, political socialization, um, <clears throat> youth sport, sexism in sport, racism in sport, violence in sport. Do you think it would be handy for someone studying um, sport journalism to have a course in sociology of sport or social psychology of sport and maybe have also an opportunity to study about sport fandom before they go into the field? Well, I yeah. certainly think so. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you touch on a lot of uh, important aspects of, uh, of sports and its place in society. Sports is really the window through which a lot of people view the society as a whole, whether it's issues of race, of gender, uh, things like that. And it's, um, we saw recently it, it can affect it negatively. I know we, we saw where um, comments from Don Imus uh, recently about Rutgers women's basketball players. Um, he admitted he was an idiot in saying it. And, but it starts a conversation, and it's a difficult conversation to have, but I think sometimes um, that needs to be done. We, we all here have covered issues over the years um, where you know Title IX and the place and the role that it's allowed women to play in sports. Mm -hmm. In journalism itself, you wouldn't know it from looking at us here, but we actually have a fairly uh, diverse staff of women and, and uh, minorities who are editors and reporters. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's reflective of society as a whole as well. I think what you touch on is a really important element, and I think it's, it helps reporters provide that kind of context sometimes. Yeah, I, I took a sociology and sport class in 1977 in college, and nobody knew what it was then. And it was the first class I went to Wake Forest. It was the first time that class had ever been offered mm -hmm. there. And we did a lot of, of readings of Harry Edwards back then. And Malcolm was just on a panel with, with Harry Edwards not too long ago. He's still relevant. I would encourage any of that kind of that coursework that they could mm -hmm. get. Thanks. Great question. Let's take another one. Thanks. My name is Ted Bailey. Um, I'm a graduate, uh, former graduate in sports management who has found success in another field, as many of those sports people end up uh, actually finding their place. Um, but uh, I wanted to ask, with the, with the advent of the NFL Network and other major sports leagues planning their own networks, what are your concerns about the objectivity of journalism and the coverage of these leagues whenever they own, broadcast, and report the sports product? 
I think it's, it's of some concern not only to those of us in the business um, because it can affect our access, but I think it ought to be of concern to the viewing public because you do get something that's uh, been processed in a way that isn't necessarily fair, full, and objective. I saw something recently, um, Pac-Man Jones has been in trouble <laughs> eight or nine times as I understand it. And just the other day, the NFL Network had the only interview with him. And it gives one pause. Um, here, here you have the network, and I don't think it purports to be fair and objective mm -hmm. and arm's length from the league itself. So it's, you make a really good point there, and it's something that viewers, news consumers, really ought to be concerned about. It, and it's becoming a bigger and bigger problem because it can distort the flow of information. Uh, I mean, for instance, even something as simple as websites. Universities are now in a position to compete for advertising dollars against traditional print outlets for the information that's on their website. So recently we saw at the University of Iowa when Steve Alford leaves to go to New Mexico, they're having a search. The, the HawkeyeSports.com website has a story quoting the athletic director as saying what he's going to say at a press conference tomorrow. So, I mean, I mean, now you're talking about the flow of information, and if I'm an advertiser, am I going to want to put my product on HawkeyeSports.com, which is likely to have an announcement first, or am I going to go to a newspaper, which is going to be playing catch-up? And, and that dynamic has never existed. As we think about the journalism business, which you were just getting us into here, newspaper readership is down something like 20%. Employment is is down uh, within newspapers. You read about papers being bought and sold, and people they're they're laying off. I don't know if if they're laying off a lot of their sports people because the, there's still a lot of sports pages. But uh, the business has some challenges. So the question for future sports journalists is: Where are they going to get the jobs? that are out there? Are they going to be in the newspapers? Are they going to have to be in the electronic media area or with internet-based publications? Where are the jobs and, and where's the money? Yeah, we're, we're struggling with that. I mean, we've, we've been pretty fortunate at our place, at least till now, with layoffs and, and travel cuts and all that. We, we've, done, we've done pretty well. But we're putting a lot of effort into our website, as Jim was talking about earlier. And there's more w different websites popping up all the time. You know, Yahoo Sports is now getting a huge commitment into sports journalism. You know, 50 some hires maybe in the last year of sports writers and columnists. Same with AOL. I mean, those may be the places that, that young journalists are going to have to look that you wouldn't necessarily associate with news gathering. But, you know, Yahoo's breaking stories. They've hired some seasoned reporters that have, have had some big stories. There does seem to be a, a pervasiveness of talk radio generally and there are some entire channels that are sports talk radio. I'm a sports fan but I'm often amazed how they can fill 24 hours a day 365 days a year of just talking about things and uh, sometimes there isn't much news on a given day but they can still talk about it all, all day long. Do you guys listen to the talk radio when you're in the car in between things or even while you're in the office writing up the next story or telling your reporters which direction to head in? We do. I, you know, I, I'll listen to it for a while on the way to work. Sometimes it's, it functions as kind of a tip service. You get a little sense of what people are talking about out mm -hmm. there and if they have listeners calling in, if it's, there's certain things on their mind, and we're going to want to be aware of it. But the, the food fight aspect of it can, can sort of get to you after a while, and I'll then you know, switch to classical music or something and take my chances that I missed out on a big tip there. But, uh, and, and, and here's how they, they deal with doing it 24 hours. They take one little thing in some person's life and then talk about it, just, just dissect it. And sometimes not, not very fairly. Uh, Kevin Durant, this uh, freshman at the University of Texas, after Texas was eliminated from the NCAA tournament, he had a quote of, you know, I wish I had played harder. I wish I had played harder all year. Okay? He's an 18 year old kid. You don't really know what he means. You weren't there. I was driving home from work. It was like 2 in the morning. It was, it's a 40 minute drive. The entire time, a guy on ESPN 
was talking about how can this kid say this? Why wasn't he playing harder? Looking, and that's probably not what he was an 18 year old after a loss, and he, he maybe had been sincere. Maybe he played, he didn't exactly play soft. He was player of the year by everybody's uh, calculations this year, but that's what happens. You get so much uh, overkill on one little thing. Mm -hmm. And how about the role of sports pages generally with regard to the entire publication? It's very easy to see with USA Today because you actually print the paper, show it, market it, color profile it in four sections, and one of them is the sports section. So, I mean, it's, it's held out there out front. It's not like in some papers where it's just the last few pages or you have to start reading from the back. Uh, how important is it to your sales, your circulation, and how is it viewed within your company? It's considered the most important section in our paper. I think it's fair to say even some of my newest colleagues would admit it. I, I worked pretty closely with John Curley, who you saw on the tape, um, when we launched USA Today. And I happened to be there as a news editor. I was Washington editor overseeing politics in the White House and that sort of thing. And he made it pretty clear, sports is really kind of the engine that's, that's going to drive this thing. And I know uh, there was a backup plan when the paper was first launched, that if somehow uh, we were not as successful as we had hoped, the fallback plan that was there actually was that it might become a sports daily. Um, to this day, we've, we've, we're now in our 25th year, and sports is still, the, I think, the key uh, section there. It's been copied by others around the country. We, don't, we try not to be smug about it. We work every bit as hard as we did at the beginning. Um, John Curley uh, likes to win. And um, in this business, one way I think you can set yourselves apart is to win. You know, get the story first, but get it right. Um, write those stories that no one else is writing out there. And we still feel that, and I think that's why it's, uh, uh, we've continued to be an important part of the newspaper. Here's a tip off to, to how important it is at our place. Um, you know, we don't publish on the weekends. Long holiday weekends, you know, Labor Day, Memorial Day, particularly Labor Day, our 1A desk will often come to us, can we get a sports cover for that Friday, which is our biggest selling paper. Mm -hmm. It's gonna be out there three days. They want the big sports cover to carry them through the weekend. And I know a long time ago, I worked in, in Knoxville, Tennessee. I think half the room will remember Johnny Majors was the, was the coach back then. And the circulation at our paper in the fall and football season skyrocketed. Hmm. Went down, then you know the rest of the year but it's driven by sports. Tennessee, University of Pittsburgh, and Iowa State. Yes, he was. That's ex exactly right. Right. In case you didn't think I was paying attention <laughs> to sports. <laughs> uh, we have a question from the audience. Good here. Uh, my name is David Price. I work at uh, Penn State Public Broadcasting. I want to go back, Tom, to actually something that you said about I was a 19-year-old male and uh, probably did some things that weren't very smart, and I think many of us can relate to that. There are a lot of 19-year-olds who do some things, maybe they get drunk and get in a fight. If one of them is not a football player, it goes away. If one of them is a football player, the program is dragged in, the coach's integrity is dragged in, his teammates are dragged in. How do you justify the over-coverage of the football player and the ignoring of the other one at the national level? The national level would have to be pretty serious. I mean, it'd have to be a, a Duke lacrosse situation or something that, that got that big for us. I, I used to always approach it, okay, what, what is going on here? You've got the quarterback will not be on the field this week for Tennessee, Georgia, wh whatever. Why? Okay, well, then he was, then you go into, because you have to explain the reasons, and that's one way to get at it. Another way to, to, to justify it is you have a coach who is out there undoubtedly saying, I recruit character, I recruit good kids. We're going to have a clean program. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. And then you have an incident where the quarterback's in a fight or something. And one, you know, one incident is not a big deal. But I've been at covered places where you all of a sudden have a, a pattern of behavior. You have a pattern of fights and you have a pattern of uh, drunken drivings and other things. And I think those are legitimate questions to ask, not just of the coach, but of the athletic director. You know, because well, it's unlike a regular student who pays his money and goes. These guys are being brought in, being actively recruited. Come to our school, come make our school better. And then what happens? You know, I would just add that as an editor, um, one of the things you need to look at is something that President Spanier said earlier, and that is we're going to be concerned if there's a sense that the kid 
the athlete is being treated differently mm -hmm. than somebody who is just your regular student. Um, if we feel there's special treatment afforded to that player or to teammates or the coaches able to help cut this person a break, we're going to probably be a little more interested in mm -hmm. what's going on with it. We're not, we're not about the business of trying to embarrass kids more than they probably already are in those circumstances. But uh, the important thing is that there be some sort of even-handedness recognizing that just the glare of publicity will alter it just naturally in some way. Could I point out one problem on the sure. local level? Because we have the luxury, we, this we, not this we. <laughs> we have the luxury that, that we don't have to worry about every small thing that happens in every place. But each beat has its own competition. And, and what this generation of athletes has to come to terms with is that we live in the era of the camera phone. It's not just people that are covering it, their peers. Could, if somebody is acting inappropriately in a bar late at night, people in Thailand could know about that in 15 minutes. I mean, that's the world they live in. And so we, meaning journalist types, are competing against that. I mean, the, the, the story that changed our world was when Mike Price was hired to coach at the University of Alabama after leaving Washington State and got into a little boys' night out problem in a strip club in Pensacola and that first saw the light of day on an Auburn fan website, mm -hmm. not in a newspaper. Now, if you're covering Alabama football for the Birmingham Post-Herald and you have to get called into your office and the boss wants to know how come I'm reading about this on an Auburn fan website, you are now going to check out the next 999 totally bogus things that come across your desk in a chat room or whatever. Or spend more time at the strip clubs and <laughs> out there well, just no, trying I, to see if anything pops I, up. I missed the Yankee trip when Billy Martin got into a little scrape and, and the beat, I was not a part of this, but the beat reporters were eager to get receipts checking out the facility where Billy had a little problem. Right. But I was not on that trip. <laughs> we have another question from the audience. Yes, sir. Uh, my name's uh, PJ Mall and I'm a student in the Center for Sports Journalism. Malcolm's actually my teacher. So. Uh, and, and you don't see a single scar, by the way. <laughs> uh, I guess the question that I have to ask for uh, the three of you guys up there, uh, there's such a touchy subject in sports right now, homosexuals in sports, and how it doesn't get that much coverage. I guess my question for you is there's a fellow that wrote for the USA Today, I don't remember his name, I think it was Mike Anderson, he wrote a book called Bloody Sunday, he was a sports writer. Uh, he had spoken to a, a, a gay athlete a while back that was in the NFL, but he never disclosed the guy's name. When are we going to start seeing sports journalists, or when will it become appropriate for sports journalists, the young aspiring sports journalists, I guess, to start asking athletes uh, what their sexual preference is. So often we ask them about their love lives and about the crimes going on outside of the, outside of the field. When will it be appropriate to start asking them more about their uh, sexual preferences? Can I handle this? Yes. Uh, on, on the one day that the university was shut down because of the Valentine's Day snowstorm, if you had been able to get to campus, you would have seen a story in USA Today that was left over from when I was there about a woman who was an essential part of the Baylor championship team in 05, who had come to terms with her sexuality and, in fact, was willing to confide in me. And, and it was really courageous that, you know, she's talking to two million people and confided in me that she had gone to therapy at one point to talk herself out of these feelings. The, the long story short, she's no longer playing despite the fact that she's an outstanding player, uh, was on the all-final four team in 05. And we devoted, what, about 40 inches to her story because she trusted me. And I, and I, I, I would dispute your characterization of it being left over since it took you about four months to actually get it to us. But well, no, no, <laughs> actually it was, done, it was done in early August. I mean, there, okay. but, but, but I did yeah. gain an appreciation for the collegiate staff members that are waiting for a return phone call three minutes before they have a class. But from, it, but from an editor's standpoint, should it be a story? Why, why would you want to Yeah, see, I, I don't know if it. I understand really about asking, if, if, if we're going to get to the point of just asking or, or pursuing, if they want to talk about it, if there's a reason for it to be a story like anything else, whether it's you know, race or where you grew up or what country you came from, I don't, I don't know. We've talked about doing a, we just haven't gotten our arms around it, doing a whole project on this, on, clearly on, on gay it's, athletes. Clearly it's a broad issue within 
sports generally, mm -hmm. but uh, is it the kind of thing where we should be systematically asking people to declare yeah, see, I, as I don't, the question suggests? Yeah, go ahead. My I, I feeling is I, no. I don't think it's ever appropriate to ask somebody right. um, what their sexual orientation is. However, there are circumstances, I'm sure it was with Malcolm with the story that he had written mm -hmm. that he had, uh, you know, they had gotten together a, a good working relationship and here was an issue that that he knew uh, a little bit about and that she felt was important to tell. Um, I was an editor uh, overseeing that story in some fashion and, and it's generally in our business, you know, Malcolm has moved on to this position here at Penn State. It's a little unusual to, to publish a story after someone has left, but I internally, I didn't have to fight too hard, but I pushed to publish this one because it is unusual where you have somebody speaking so candidly and you have somebody writing it in such a sophisticated, rich way that really, I think, helps people understand a much larger issue. You know, you, you had a, I think, it, Penn State uh, grad, John Amici, recently, mm -hmm. um, came out with a book uh, talking about his sexual orientation and some of the problems and the obstacles that he faced uh, in his life. And uh, yeah, that's instructive to society. I, I think there are a lot of people who wish that perhaps someone would have been able to talk about it well before they've they've stepped down from the game but um, I think I don't think it's ever appropriate to ask unless it's someone you're quite comfortable with and there's really a story to be told and you're gonna work on it one of the things I'd like to do before we wind down our program is to hear maybe a, an anecdote from each of you about stories that you have written or covered uh, or or edited that uh, you think over the years, as you look back on it, have been particularly meaningful either in your own career or they've made a difference in some way or, or just been something that uh, makes for a, a good story when you like to talk uh, about what happened during your uh, career. Uh, Where'd you go? <laughs> I, I, I know, I know you, 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 you got a hundred you could choose from, but kind of what stands out there that uh, you know, is a story you love to tell about your job, and oh, when I covered this story, I've, I've got one that, that actually we did in the last year that that I had developed a friendship with a sports historian. He was a professor in Missouri. He had stumbled not Missouri, Missouri St. Louis. He had stumbled into a story on a trip to South Africa about a place called Robin Island, which was a prison that uh, was used in apartheid times. That, that, that black men were sent to. And they used soccer as a way to pass the time. And this, this, uh, they created soccer leagues and it really kept the morale up. And he got to start it on a book, which he decided wasn't gonna really be a book, but he, it's actually being produced right now as a, as a television documentary. And we assigned, assigned a, a writer, a really good writer named Eric Brady, to work with him on this. And it was a story that really hadn't been told about the, the power, it was all sorts of levels of, of, of sociology and sport all that we were talking about earlier. And it, it got a lot of reaction from around the world because this guy forwarded it to the FIFA people, the people in South Africa. There's a British uh, unit making its documentary of it. CBS News got on it. And it was just uh, it was one of those unique stories that you don't, you don't ever read. Malcolm, uh, other than the time you interviewed me, uh, <laughs> what... Uh... And, and I do owe you a lunch, I think. That's, uh... <laughs> well, I mean, I, I can uh, either credit or blame this guy because he called me one day five years ago, it's hard to believe, and said, we need to do a project about why there are so few African-American head football coaches in Division 1A. I mean, it's, it's not enough to say what the numbers are because everybody knows what the numbers are. They're embarrassing. But the issue is why and, and what is happening in the pipeline that prevents people from becoming coordinators and getting to the place where they can be considered for a head coaching job. And we got a lot of response because we went beyond numbers and talked to people about the so-called country club factor, that, it, that there was a social component and that a lot of places were not in a position to deal with that. And, I mean, it was a very rewarding experience. Jim? I would say, you know, Malcolm mentioned that story. The ones that I look back on that I handled primarily as an editor, not so much as a reporter, were those dealing with issues, uh, issues of the student athlete. Um, back in the early 90s, we, we did a very exhaustive study of... Uh, 
graduation rates for uh, men's and women's basketball players and football players at uh, all through all of Division One, and, and we uh, we sought document you know documentation. We uh, we went to court in some cases to try and get the information. But this was the first time this had really been revealed in kind of a comprehensive fashion. We took one particular school and showed that they a uh, very competitive school that hadn't been able to graduate even one player, one basketball player in five or six years. We had one school where we went and tracked back their final four team and, and saw where some of them were just in awful situations. Um, um, and you know, pointing up the, the need for the schools to take some responsibility for some of the people that they had brought into their programs that way. So I look back on it, largely the college reform issues were the ones that I think um, stood out the most in, in my mm -hmm. recollection. And you've covered college and professional sports. Um, do you have a preference? Is there something special about one versus the other? I mean, I've, I've liked both, but there's something about the context of the college experience. And, the, and a guy can win an NBA championship in a lot of years, he'll have a chance. But you have that one moment in college that makes it special. Well, I want to thank all of our guests for being part of this great discussion tonight and remind all of you that tonight's program will be stored in an electronic archive that can be accessed through WPSU.org. This site also links to online resources on tonight's topic. Thank you to our guests, Malcolm Moran, Director of Penn State Center for Sports Journalism, Tom O'Toole, College Sports Editor for USA Today, and Jim Welch, Deputy Managing Editor for Sports at to USA Business. Today. And my special thanks to our studio audience. To the best of my knowledge, is a production of Penn State Public Broadcasting. For all of us here at WPSU, I'm Penn State President Graham Spanier. Good night. A copy of the program you've just seen can be purchased through Penn State Media Sales at mediasales.psu.edu or by calling 800-770-2111.